We're back on the water uh, in the entrance to the Seiko Boss, and I'm joined with a good friend of mine, former Protea angler, August Lingno. Um, I don't think there's anybody who knows more about this river besides the team fishing today than this man. He won on the Vol River Nationals in 2013, and you were part of the team in 2017. You put in a sick leave day at work, and uh, you've, you've joined us here on the water. Yeah, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, it's, a, it's a great event, and uh, it's a great to be out on the water today. Um, I'm quite excited to see what the guys are up to. Uh, we've got one of the prettier boats behind us here. Um, we don't know what, what they're up to yet, um, but it's, it's good to be out here and to, to see some familiar friends and uh, um, just do it from the other side. Uh, in 2017, last day, it was quite nerve-wracking, so it's actually quite refreshing to be on the other side. <laughs> Yeah, a lot less uh, nerves for you, a lot calmer. Um, tell us about what you would, I mean, before you know what's going on down here, I mean, if you were fishing this event, what would your be approach be? Yeah, look, the, the river is a little bit of a conundrum, you know. Um, back in 2017, we were here in, in a spawn, um, or close to spawn. That time of the year, historically, fish move into what we call man-made structures so jetties rocks those type of things and then you get like a segment where they sort of disappear and then they move into what i would call wooden structure you know anything that is like willows lay downs those type of things and they they pull in tight to that structure and so historically this time of the year that's what they would do and it it seems you know driving around this morning it seems like that's more or less what the guys are up to um so if i came here with no prior knowledge of what's going on currently i would sort of like stick to that sort of pattern where you where you fish specific areas um for willows laydowns wood those type of things and what makes it sort of difficult is the weather that came through um that creates some current uh the bass in general here don't like the current that much so all it does is they stick to those structures they just pull in a lot tighter you know so you need to get more specific with your casting um, you really have to be on it um, getting tight to those wood those wooden structures and get into the back of willows um, a lot more you know so you'll you'll get lucky around the edges but you need to be a lot more precise and that makes it a lot more taxing on the guys and makes it a lot more frustrating um, so you need to keep your head in the game um, it also limits the bites a bit because the bass don't often move out of that structure so you need to go get him in the back there as a rule um, making it a lot more tougher um, so you you miss a few more fish uh, that would usually come out and, and eat the reaction let's talk about that now you're saying you would fish a lot tighter to the cover in that wood in that thick stuff what type of line you're pitching in there what baits do you recommend at this time of the year it's a difficult one um, the, there is certain scenarios where I would go light um, this time of the year. There are certain times during this phase that they do actually sit on like a like a ten foot drop off line here. Um, you know, especially on something like like we're seeing back here, is these points they often make like a little drop at at ten foot where you where you can fish with something like a mojo or, or something like that where the lighter line really does help but as a rule going into these trees i don't go under 15 um, because there's just too much stuff around it that breaks you off and you just cannot afford to drop a big fish in this tournament so i'd guess these guys are not under 15 now um, when we fished in 2017 we didn't go under 20 just to put those fish in the boat um, it was just that important so the watercolor isn't something that uh, that would make me go light, so I'd stick to 15, at least a strong 15. Now, uh, two new teams that have joined this event, I know you mentioned earlier on you watched the leaderboard there. We've got Australia doing extremely well in this event, as well as Korea, Korea limiting on every single day on all three boats. Yeah, that I found it quite interesting, um, the, the Aussie guys, you know what I what I said coming here is I thought the USA guys would do exceptionally well, you know, because they they knew the river. But maybe they came back with with sort of the view from 2017, and and it's changed. I mean, 
from then to now that seasonal change it does change so if you stuck to the structure usually you you really struggle um you can even blank um but coming here for the first time now would be much more beneficial because as a bass angler the first thing you would do is relate to these type of structures you know the wood the willows which is a nice thing to fish you know for us as bass anglers so coming here for the, for the first time no prior knowledge you can actually get onto them quite quite quickly especially if you are a good angler and you can pitch quite well and you can you get your lures in there so um surprising but but not unsurprising if i can call it that um you know driving past we saw some of the aussie boats and uh they seemed to be full already which uh and they were exactly on the type of structure we we just discussed you know and and looking like they were doing like a pitching type deal so makes sense um obviously there's a lot of info going around from you know guys helping the other teams out then uh, that's not that's not a bad thing it makes it nice competitive what is quite nice with the aussies being so close is today the Oaks have to bring it, um, yep. you know, five points, five points in this format, it, it's, it's very, very close, I cannot, I mean, we're getting to a point where sort of a fish makes a difference here, um, you know, and, and I can tell you that that's stressful on the anglers, you know, so for both the Aussies and for, for the SA guys, you know, but it's, it's for the SA guys to, to lose, that's for sure, um, the Aussies, even a second place would be exceptional. So I think there's a lot less pressure on them than on the SA guys. Um, but five points, not a lot. Yeah, well, that's fantastic information there from August. And uh, we'll continue the discussions as the day goes on. But we've got some footage from the team from Australia. So let's take a look at that. At Mercury, we've been reshaping power. How you use it is completely up to you. Introducing the all-new V8 Mercury 4-stroke. Light, quick, efficient. Mercury, go boldly.
So we've caught up with uh, Martin de Kock and Daryl Quinton. Uh, August, an interesting that they're so far up the Sakerbos. Yeah, look, historically the Sakerbos this time of year does well. Um, it brings big fish. What it's not known for, what we've sort of discussed, is uh, is the ability to hold fish for three days. Um, so that's something, you know, obviously the guys coming up here um, will know what what's left. Um, Obviously, they fished it the, the two days before um, and would have saved it. Uh, the sport management uh, of this specific team is quite good. so um, And it's a key key factor in, in a three-day comp. So, obviously, they, l they left some stuff behind. Um, what, what does happen is we've got a lot of current with the rain now. And what often happens this time of the year is that the fish start or keep on moving up with the current and that's why we probably so far up we're very close to to almost the end of the line here and uh, nothing is really different from what we've discussed um, we can see they they're still fishing you know proper proper structure it's a little bit different a little bit less wood a um, little bit more reeds and then some scattered rock in here that that's quite nice and the fish there's a lot of stuff they can that can hang around in um, so what we've seen pulling in here is that they do a, like a one-two punch, like you said, um, one oak on a reaction and one oak the typical pitching style. And uh, now they've both switched to, to that typical pitching, getting in there into the structure, especially with, with current. What we see is that the bass hold to the same stuff, but they just pull in a lot tighter into those structures. Um, so you need to get your pitching in there. And, and I mean, two phenomenal anglers, uh, DQ is probably one of the guys that knows the river the best, uh, you know, if not second best. Um, he's won a hell of a lot of comps here. It's really a great guy to have in a team for this event. And then we've got Martin de Kock. Um, you know, I think he's won probably the most nationals. I think he's at like three nationals that he's won. Um, I mean, I can't think of any tournament locally that he hasn't won. I right. mean, it's just that good. Guys commenting, you know, you know, they want to see his gills. He's just that good. He just understands fishing, and it's all in his head. I mean, he's a phenomenal guy, phenomenal angler. Yeah, so to have a combo like that in the SA team, is, it's absolutely fantastic. I think they also got the biggest bag on day one, like 6-9 or something, which is phenomenal for this time of the year. So um, we don't know exactly what they've got now. We know one of the SA boats are, are full. One of the SA boats still need a couple of fish, and then. But well, tell me, tell me about. I mean, having been in the team, we both know there's a lot of tactics that come in it. We spoke about it from day one all the way through to day three. Now, managing your fish and working as a team, and the importance of that. We saw Justy and Craig moving out. You know, yeah, they let us know they've got a limit. Next boat's pulled in. How important is that? I mean, the format we're fishing, like we've said at lends itself to being a team event and that's what this is all about you cannot have a dot boat because of the the way the point system works you just it it just completely breaks your momentum um, with the penalty system so it's extremely important to have proper communication on the water and know exactly who's doing what who's struggling and where the fish are and and in a free day comp is managing those fish you cannot come here in your day one and hammer all your fish you need to sort of take that risk of letting a few fish behind so that you've got fish for day three. Um, you can easily fall out the bus here. I mean, we've discussed... Well, I'm going to cut you off there for a second. We, we took a look at the amount of boats in this river on day one. So if we look at it from a South, Afri a South African perspective, you know, the tactics that they want to employ here, perhaps they were looking to, to keep this area as a reserve, you know, rotate it amongst the team and fill it up. But we had in some cases 15 boats in this area on day one and that almost that almost puts pressure on you as a team to say well rather us pick them all off than let uh, one of the other teams do it 
Yeah, exactly that. And that's something that you sort of have to call call as you go along. Um, you know, taking fish off in, in the first two days does take fish away from the other teams, you know. So it does give you that little bit of a buffer. Um, you know, 15 boats in here is not ideal. That's not the type of river that lasts that long. Um, so I'm quite impressed that, that our guys already got a, got a limit. Um, and that shows how well they've managed it, especially this far up. Um, probably they've sort of kept the other teams out here and just managed to to get just enough fish to to keep going and leave enough for for the last two days. So probably the plan is to rotate all three boats, you know, through here. The first one, like you said, is out now, full, and uh, you know, pulling in the second boat. Um, like we said, we don't know how they're doing, but probably not full yet, as as they're still up here. And then we've got our third boat in the mouth of the river, uh, fishing those structures, probably waiting for the call up. Um, you know, that's how we did, did it in 2017 as well. Um, you know, it's a team event and you have to manage it like that. Um, if you don't, you will fall behind. And that's that's the beauty of, of world champs. That's, that's how it works. My first bass, I caught at my grandparents' lake, and I just remember the way that it fought and jumped, and that's the one that ruined me. After that, all I wanted to do was fish for bass. When I first started fishing, everything was what you would see with your eyes or with your polarized glasses. You know, my first boat didn't have a depth finder. I was fishing out of a 14-foot aluminum boat with a little gas outboard, and I remember just getting my first transom-mounted trolling motor. What a, what a game changer it was just to be able to go down the bank. And I learned real fast that boat control was everything. I feel like I have an advantage with Minn Kota and Humminbird with this one boat network. Everything is integrated together. My talons work with my Lake Master mapping and my depth finders and my Ultrex. They all think and work together. And you have multiple ways to run all of them from your iPilot link to your individual remotes, from the Bluetooth on your phone, um, right off of the depth finder screen. So anywhere you're at in the boat, you have total boat control. I can actually navigate to a waypoint and just have the trolling motor take me to it so I can retie or re-rig while I'm going there. Side imaging, mega imaging, that's a huge game changer. It allows me to look at so much more water, so much more efficiently, and get a very detailed picture. You know, Spotlock holds me within about a 36 inch circle. Um, you know, that trolling motor is not gonna move out of that. So it's just incredible the precision that we have now, um, not only with our GPS, but also, you know, with mapping. It's not supposed to be hard to understand what your electronics are showing you or how to run that trolling motor or to stay in one spot or to put your talents down. It's supposed to be easy. And with Minn Kota and Humminbird and the One Boat Network, it's easy. First off, August, I want to thank you for joining me this morning. Um, being out here on the water, very informative with you. I think you taught me a lot, as well as I'm sure most of the guys watching out there. So thanks very much for joining me. Um, unfortunately, we took a gamble coming to follow the South African guys. And as it is, you know, timing cannot always be perfect. We didn't get to see a fish catch. But we got to talk a lot about the areas that they're fishing and the baits, specifically that they're fishing. Now, you've got a couple of lures in your hands here, a few examples of some of the things that you may see on their deck. Yes. Um yeah, look, it's been fun. Um, it's it's really nice to be out here and seeing what the guys are doing and just being part of the whole thing. You know, bait-wise, we, we talked a lot about creature-type baits. Um, you know, we've got an example here of, of the bur or the power bait uh, pit boss. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a general creature bait, you know. There's a lot around and a little bit smaller profiles they like in this river. Um, you know, what, what are we imitating there? I mean, we, it's a craw bait. We're imitating craws and crabs. Um, a large part of, of the father year is actually uh, like crabs and sort of like smallish crayfish. Um, so craw imitations does the job. You don't want to go too big, um, or as a rule, you don't want to go too big in this river. So you know, small type creature baits is, is usually what does the deal. Um, 
I find. What about that more of a reaction bite? I mean, when you, you we talked about the one-two punch there. One guy's fishing a reaction, the other guy's fishing fishing a plastic. What sort of things are we looking at? Look, reaction-wise, the the shallow running cranks, you know, square balls, stuff that bounces off structure quite nicely helps a lot. You know, because you want even even if you're fishing a reaction like a spinner bait or a or a uh, crank bait. You want to still get it in the structure because the fish relate to the structure. They pull in tight to it, like we discussed. So you want something that bounces off it. You, know? you want that dif- deflection, you know, that yeah. that exactly. sudden jerk in motion. You want to, we, we say you, you knock before you go in, you know. You want to bump that tree, go over it, and that's usually when you get that bite, you know. You bump, pause, and they eat it. Um, so that's exactly what you're doing with, with, your, with your reaction type baits as well. There is a lot of bait fish in this river. So it's a m- it's m- a part of the main diet of these fish is bait fish. There's a lot of it around, um, you know. So when when we do have bait fish patterns that relate to these trees and these fish pulling there, um, you're gonna have that bite. So now tell me how important I mean when we're fishing our plastics, how important is scent and smell? I saw a lot of the guys picking up sprays, spraying their baits, scent and smells, just to keep them holding on for a bit longer. Yes, the holding on and finding the baits. Um, you know, a little bit more stained water. Often you you find that um, just that little, and it depends on the on the type you use. There's better ones and poorer ones, but definitely this river always a scent. Always, always, always. It just helps. Oh, we got the Ber- we got the Berkeley General. It's the you know your stick stick bait type lure. I'm gonna just put that down on the deck. I've got one in my pocket here, so we can take a closer look. I mean, this is. This is what you're saying, you, you know, your slow falling, wacky rigs, uh, you know, a more finesse presentation. Yes, and uh, actually particularly good color because it imitates, you know, a large portion of the, the bait fish in this river, you know, a little bit more carpish type color, um, you know, and that, that, smo- that slow fall through the, um, through the cover that you're putting it into just often more than often gets the bite um it just s- smell on it, as well. it just stays in that strike zone longer yeah this thing is <laughs> smelly <laughs> yeah that's a, something like this is a the, it's a proper imitation for the river um you know one thing i've learned through the years is to actually try and imitate what the fish are eating um i don't i don't choose lure size and these guys as well they don't choose lure size based on what you want to catch you don't you know you you base your lure size on that which they are eating if they're eating a two inch crayfish or crab mm. then that's what you must be representing so putting in a 10 inch lure it's not what they're eating you know so yeah you'll get the fish but if you the closer you get to what they're eating um the long the more bites you'll get and that's that's what's key in these especially on day three so you now need to go catch those reluctant fish that didn't want to eat the first three days because okay. the other ones are gone out. Some great insight there from August again, my buddy. Thank you very much. I know you're sticking around for the way in this afternoon. Um, it's been a pleasant day on the water. Things are tough. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing the team come in. Yes. It's either one of the three. We've got South Africa, Australia, we've got Germany, we've got Italy, all of those guys in the running. It's going to be super interesting. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being with us here today. We're going to cross over to the live way in. I hope you enjoy. Five minutes, that's all it takes to catch five fish. Yes, let's get to it.